Okay. All right, everybody. Again, so how's everybody feeling about the level of light here? I'm okay with this, but I don't want people to fall asleep. It is a little warm in here. Should I turn on the lights? It's so oh, it's not warm. Warm. I like my like flash. Nice. Is it fun? Okay, let's put it turned it on. It was it was 76 degrees in here when I got in here. So I turned on the AC. So I was still hot, but I understand that sitting right here might be a little bit chilly right now. Um all right, so so how do we feel about light stuff? Is this good level of light? Yeah. Bring lights on. That's good. That's what you This is how I would like to study if I was said that this is also how I would like take a nap if I was in lecture and didn't want to pay attention. So I'll leave that up to you. That's true. Um all right, so let's start with a little bit of uh, Excel work, um, just to recap how to do plots in Excel. I think everybody's fairly well versed in that at this point, but just as uh, a recap, we'll do, do the problem that we skipped the other day about how do we figure out what order this is based on just time and concentration data. And then we'll do one that's like the uh, figuring out activation energy from K at different temperatures. So uh, from this, I'm just going to start by copy and pasting the data in here. Uh, down here with your formatting. Um, so if we wanted to figure out if this is zero order, first order, second order, what are the three graphs that we have to do? If it's zero order, what will give me a straight line? Concentration versus time, natural log versus uh, concentration versus time, one over. If it's zero order, which one is it? Just straight concentration versus time. If it's first order, Alexis, you just said it in a second. Ln of a. Yeah. And then if it's second order, it should be one over it. So I'm just going to make those three columns right now. Um, because if it's real data, it's not always entirely obvious just by plotting the data which one it is. Because if you zoom in on a natural log plot uh, or on a curved plot enough, it looks like a straight line, right? So the easiest way to do it is to just do all three of them. So ln of a and then one over a. So Oops, not that. And take natural log is literally just you know, equals to tell Excel you want to do math, type in LN, open parentheses, and then select the cell you want to take natural log of. And then if we want one over A equals one divided by, pick the cell you want to take the natural log of. And remember that when we copy and paste formulas in Excel, it changes the cell reference with it. So we don't have to retype it every time. So we can literally just copy those two formulas, select the cells we want those to have those two formulas, paste them. And if you look, if you're one of these ones just sitting here in the middle there, the formula is equals LN of C8. So it brought that cell down with us. Which again, should all be reviewed at this point. I think everybody's well, that can at least make plots in Excel, but some of the formula stuff is a little bit trickier, takes some more practice. Uh, as far as making those plots, remember we always want scatter plots. In the sciences, we don't do anything with any of these other plots, bar plots, line plots, anything like that. Forget all that. And in science, we want everything to be a scatter plot because we want to tell it both what X is and what Y is. Line plots look like scatter plots. One of these ones, but the difference is, is that a line plot, um, it assumes that all of your y values are equidistant from each other. So that in other words, x equals one, then two, then three, then four. If you have a difference, which would be okay in this case, because we have um, 10, 20, these are all equally spaced. But anytime you have something where maybe this may be you know, any real data where you measured it in 42 seconds instead of 40 seconds, a line plot's not going to take that into account. So we always want scatter plots in the sciences. Ah. Sorry, I clicked out of the menu and 
I've done something I didn't mean to. Um, and then the other thing I always I always remind people is that in Excel and, and to a lesser degree in Sheets and in the online version of Excel, we don't want the Excel to do any of the thinking for us because in general, it doesn't do it right. For science majors, especially when we want to control everything about our graph, we don't want it picking options for us. So we do instead, if you just go to insert a graph, if, you're, if it's sitting right here, um, that cursor I mean, the selected cell is sitting right here, it'll automatically populate all of those series for us, which might it might do it right, but it might not. And so what's generally faster and more consistent is you put the cursor, the selected cell away from everything else. Don't have it touching any of your data. And then when you go to insert, you get a blank box, which is actually what we want if we want to control everything, right? Um, and then right click and go to select data. If you're doing this in Sheets, most of this looks pretty similar. Um, sheets in the online version of Excel can both be a little bit picky about the order that your data is in. The online version of Excel in particular, Sheets used to be a real problem with this, um, but now they've fixed it for the most part. It's so your, your um, steps look, your menus look a little bit different, but the general process is once you get that blank box, then we're just going to tell it what we want for our X values and what we want for our Y values. So that looks fairly linear. There's a little bit of a curve to it, but not that much, right? So one of the ways we can tell is we're going to put in a trend line and display the R squared value. Whichever one has the R squared value that's closest to one will tell us which of these series is best. Uh, and for this one, we'll just put in the title. I'm just going to type in the title, but you can also just um, click in a cell, pick the title as well. And then if we want to just put all of these, if we want to do three different graphs, that's fine. If we want to do all of them on the same graph, um, then we'll just add to the same, same one here. We still want to pick time for the X's. And now we're going to pick natural log for the Y and series name LN. And just looking at it, that looks a little bit more linear, but maybe still maybe not perfectly linear. So let's do the one, add the one over just to be sure. Over concentration of A, X values, Y values. And that one doesn't look all that linear either. But again, just to be sure, for each of these, we can go through and add the trend line, and we'll see which one has the R squared closest to one. Remember, if it's perfectly linear, R squared should be exactly one. And if it's totally random, not linear at all, R squared would be zero. So the closest to zero you can get tells you which one of these sets of data is gonna be the most linear. So there's tre add trend line, you, and then down at the bottom, display equation, display R squared. So just the concentration of A gave us an R squared of 0.976, still pretty close to one, still pretty linear. Add trend line. Ah, but there it is. R squared is exactly one for the natural log of A. Just in the interest of finishing this up. So that's coincidence that those two spreads are that close together. They don't, won't always be that close together. But even the ones that aren't linear are still going to be somewhat of a straight line. They're still going to be a general trend, right? So they're all going to look kind of linear. It's about which one looks the most linear, which is definitely the orange one um, and then also just as uh, for general general knowledge if you want to put if you want to put more design elements in here like if you wanted to display a um, uh, a legend or something like that most of those options you're going to find by going up here to the chart tools and you can add add chart element and one of those options is legend. So then we can say, um, 
and you can have it set up like that. You can change it so that it overlays it. The other thing you can do to make this larger and keep the right formatting is if you move chart, in most of these, you can say make it its own sheet. Then you'll just get a full page one here. So there's plenty of, so you can see what's going on here pretty easily. But in general, with in Excel or Google Docs or any of these tools, a lot of the formatting stuff, it's not strictly speaking doing science, but it's part of trying to make your stuff look good, make your data look good, presenting data, um, which whether or not scientists want to actually do, I guess I, being able to document your results um, is basically what makes something science. If you're not writing stuff down, it's not really science. Um, most recently, the best description I've had, I've heard is the difference between science and fuck around and find out is writing stuff down. Right? If you write stuff down, it's science. Otherwise, you're just it's you're just you know messing around, occupying time. Maybe it's you know making it so you're not bored, but you're not doing science. So being able to make good charts is part of that, and part of that is learning just clicking around through menus, figuring out what works, making it make look good, not just getting good enough so you can turn it in. There is some element to that as well. Um, but uh, you would not believe the amount of time I spent on formatting figures in grad school. It's it can be soul crushing, I get that. Especially when you put one extra space somewhere in your Word document and all of the formatting for everything changes. Um, Word needs to be even worse about that, believe it or not. So I get being over it and just wanting to turn stuff into. All right, anyway, back to relevant stuff. Let's look at, close this, we don't need that anymore. If we're trying to do the, uh, the map for our lab this week, or part B in particular, we wanna find, um, if we're just trying to find K for a certain temperature, what we already have is good enough, right? This does give us K for the reaction. Um, and actually, I guess I should also specify, sometimes if K is really big or really small, it'll only give you one sig fig or two sig figs on the slope. But that's usually, we want more sig figs than that if we're trying to do some calculations with the slope. So what you can always do when you have it like this, and again, Sheets has a similar option, you, if you right click on, on the label, you go to format trend line label. It just says category general. That basically it means what type of number is it? You want to tell it how to write stuff in a different format. Like, like we're, you know, this isn't a business class. So we're not going to do anything with currency or accounting and date and time are notoriously. Um, don't talk to a computer scientist or a programmer about dates and times because it'll trigger PTSD for them. Um, it's like the least favorite job of any programmer is dealing with dates because things like leap years mess with stuff and date formatting is really weird. Anyway, um, you can always just go down to scientific though and that tells, tells it that you want it to be in um, scientific notation. And then you can also just come in here or just go over to the, actually there's an option, right? You can do there this. You want to make it bigger so it's legible. And most of you didn't have the, I'm not sure I'd call it a benefit, um, but didn't have me helping you or teaching you Excel skills last year um, or last quarters. So if you did, you know that I'm very picky about Excel stuff. Um, Teach your fingers to sit on control and Z or command and Z if you're on a Mac, because all the time in Excel, you'll do something, you'll accidentally hit some button, you'll hit enter instead of, or you'll delete a formula instead of copying a formula. Um, control Z just undoes whatever it is you just did. So I just always keep, um, you know, my hands are just trained to keep my, my left pinky sits on control at all times because control Z, control C, control X, control B, all those keyboard shortcuts um, are really critical for not having to redo a whole bunch of work. So good.
good life skill there. Um, is there anything else I need to say here? No. So the slope right there on this graph, that is K for us already, right? If you remember our equation, it's for if it's a first order reaction when you plot the natural log of the reaction of the concentration versus time, negative K is the slope. So K is 1.12 times 10 to the minus two for this reaction. This is all we need to get the equilibrium constant, but if we want the activation energy and the pre in the pre-exponential factor so that we can figure out K at any temperature, we have to do the experiment we did in class today for part B, um, which is, which means we're going to plot the uh, natural log of K. So let me go throw the equation back on the board real quick. Uh, there it is already, it's still there. Um, so this just comes from that expression, that Arrhenius equation. Equilibrium constant is equal to some constant called pre-exponential factor times e to the minus activation energy over RT, which rearranging that like we did before gives us this. So if we want activation energy and the Arrhenius factor, we just need K at a couple different temperatures. And so we have more than one temperature or more than two temperatures. We, we ended class doing it with just by hand for those two temperatures, right? We have more than one, um, more than one pair, sorry, more than two data points. Then what we actually want to do is throw it into Excel and get the slope of the line. And so similar to the way we just did it, Um, and in this case, um, if I'm just going to plot the data at temperature in Celsius, I'm just going to do the way I would usually do any of these. The other nice thing about Control Z is it also undoes auto formatting. Just notice when I just put in parentheses Celsius for degrees, and then it hits hit space, it turned it into a copyright sign. Um, I didn't want it to auto format that. If you control Z, it undoes that auto formatting, which is can also be helpful. And then we have K as measured um, in the lab. If I type all this in, so everything going up by, so 25, five. Um, and just a reminder, Excel automatically understands the exponential or the uh, E um, shortcut for scientific notation. So you don't have to type in times 10 to the minus 5. Like 2.85 E to the minus 4. If I'm seeing that right. 2.54 E to the minus 4. 2.39. Minus three and six point three three e to the minus three. All right, so if we want to actually plot that, if we want to plot the natural log of K versus one over the temperature in Kelvin. So I'm just going to keep adding columns going across till I get to the um, get everything done. So first thing I can do is take temperature in Celsius and put it in Kelvin, which that's an easy conversion. That plus 273. And we're to the plus or minus one in the, in the degrees. So I'm just going to leave it as 273. I'm going to leave off that 0.15. Doesn't really matter. And then we have, you can do one over T. then label one over K.
So now we have our two columns. Here's the other reason you don't want Excel to think for you or Google Sheets to think for you. If you just leave your data like this um, and you let it think for you, it's not necessarily going to know which columns to plot. You're going to get a whole bunch of extra random data in there. Um, and if you're using the online version of Excel in particular, the data that you want to plot in a scatter plot has to be the first two columns, in which case you kind of have to copy and paste the data and put it by itself somewhere else. Um, but you don't want to just paste the formulas. So what you can do is copy them. And then when you go to paste that, when you right click, one of the options is to paste it as values, um, which means it doesn't copy and paste the, uh, the formulas as well. It just brings the numbers over. Um, but as we're using real Excel, um, it doesn't really matter. It'll let us pick and choose our uh, X's and Y's however we like, so we don't have to worry about that as much. Select data, boom, X values, one over T, right? Y values. Look at that, nice and linear data. What is this going on in the back? There's our nice straight line. Add a trend line. Get the equation for the trend line. Get the R squared. Is this is fake data? I will expect R squared is skip R squared one. Your R squared is not going to be one. Hopefully it's close to one. Anything above 0.9 is acceptable for this lab. Should LN of K values be negative as well? Or, or so LN of K is going to be based on what K is, right? If you take natural log of any number that's less than one, you're going to get a negative value for the log. But if K is big, then you're going to get a number that's positive, a K value that's positive. You still get the slope should still be um, should still be linear, and the slope will look a lot like this, it might just be shifted up or down. Because ours is upwards, but the R squared is nearly one. So, so you, you know, it still looks nice and linear, but that's part of that is just because if, if it's a fast reaction, then A is big. Um, and the, but the slope should still work pretty similarly. And the other thing you can do if you want your, your slope with more sig figs um, is you can actually just have it count. You don't even really need the chart to get the slope here. If I want to just get have Excel calculate the slope in the intercept for me and the R squared without actually making the graph, um, you can just say equals slope. When you open parentheses, it says known Y's, comma, known X's. There's my known Y's. There's my known X's. It gives me the same number for the slope, right? But then I can control how many sig figs it shows me. And you can do the same thing for the intercept and for the R squared. Equals intercept, known Y's, known X's. There's my Y's. There's my X's. Um, and I actually... I think it's equals RSQ maybe. Yeah, RSQ, known Y's, known X's. Um, if you have a feeling that Excel, so it's not exactly one, it's really, really close to one, but it's not perfectly one, probably because of rounding errors um, at some point. Um, but anything that Anything mathematical that you think Excel might be able to do, Google is your friend. Apps like I, if I hadn't remembered that it was equals RSQ, I would have, I would have just Google. Maybe not Google these days because Google's pretty garbage. But I would have used the search engine to just say Excel formula R squared. In you know somebody has a formula, or there's at least in a forum somewhere or written, written an article about it. About how to do that, but if you want to do like if you want to know how to use Excel to do a two tailed t test for your stats class instead of doing it on your calculator, um, you know, the internet is your friend in that case. All right, 
Any questions about Excel at this point or spreadsheets in general? Do you have any issues, specific issues when it comes to doing this on sheets? One, does everybody know how, to, if you're a student here, you can get the downloaded version of Excel for free. Um, did everybody get shown that link last, last quarter or first quarter? Okay. Um, if you need help with that, just let me know. I can show you where to find that. Um, it, menus, again, look a little different if you're on a Mac as well. But I would highly encourage all of you to, you know, at no point ever use the online version of Excel. It is just a dumpster fire. Um, so, like, the downloaded version of Excel, great. Google Sheets, even at this point, Google Sheets was as bad as online Excel for a while, but it's gotten a lot better. Um, and those are both free for you as students. When you're not a student, then your trial for Microsoft is probably going to expire. Well, wherever you go next, wherever you transfer to, they're going to have access to Microsoft Office too. Um, so you might just have to log in with your new credentials or something like that. Um, get to know spreadsheets because if you do science, you have to be able to work in spreadsheets. Everything, everybody uses spreadsheets to keep track of their data and do repetitive calculation. Um, even if you're not in the sciences, even if you're, you know, you're managing a restaurant, keeping track of people's hours and shifts or ordering inventory, stuff like that. There are expensive programs you can buy that'll do that for you, or if you're good with Excel, you just use spreadsheets. People use spreadsheets for everything. Um, and it's one of those things where if you if you get good with Excel, you can make good figures and people will inherently think you're smarter because you're good with Excel. Um, you don't actually have to be that smart for people to think you're smart. You just have to be good with numbers, basically, right? Half the reason that's worth getting a science degree over another degree is because inherently people assume you know how to do that and then think you're smarter. Whether or not that's fair is another story, um, but it's, it is something I've noticed in my life is that people assume just when they hear I have a chemistry degree, like, oh, you must be smart. No, but I did take a lot of chemistry classes. Um, anyway, that's neither here nor there. All right, so that's how we get activation of frequency factor. And then if we want the rate constant at a different temperature, we would just plug in a different temperature in Celsius, put it in Kelvin, put it as one over T, um, and then solve for K. Um, that is really everything you need to know in order to figure out how fast a reaction is going to happen under any conditions, any temperature, any, any concentrations. Once we know it's first order, um, that really, and once we have activation energy and the pre-exponential factor, that tells us a ton about a reaction and how it behaves in the real world. And just as a plug for computational chemistry, one of the, since the, my grad school research was in computational chemistry, the number one thing that we calculated for other research groups that was useful to other research groups was we could actually calculate and predict an activation energy for a reaction without having to measure things in, in the lab, without having to go out and order chemicals or anything like that. Turns out if you can build the structures on a computer and run the right calculations, you can figure out what the transition state looks like. And if you know what the transition state looks like, you can calculate that energy. And if you know the activation energy, you can figure out if that reaction is going to happen in real time at room temperature. Um, and so we did a lot of that for my for my research was trying to figure out activation energies from the other side, from the purely theoretical side, um, which was had its own headaches. Um, remember those, you know, n dimensional spaces. I had to spend a lot of time thinking about those for years. So something easier. Let's talk about radioactivity. Um, turns out radioactivity is different than the chemistry we've been doing so far, but it's actually not any harder. It just has its own set of rules and vocabulary. So most of what we're going to be going over today is we're going to, we're going to define some terms and talk about some new types of reactions that are 
we're going to classify all called nuclear reactions. Um, so Becquerel was one of the first um, one of the first scientists to figure out what kind of what was happening with radioactivity to some extent. Um, and he, he was trying to figure out at this point, this is, we're talking late 1800s, maybe mid to late 1800s, 1860s or so. Um, it was known that there were some minerals that if you expose them to light and then you turned off the light, they would glow, they would phosphoresce. Um, and that's, they were kind of was getting into the process. They didn't have orbitals per se to understand this. This kind of diagram explaining how phosphorescence and glowing materials work didn't come until after quantum mechanics occurred. Um, research started coming into its own, which is like, you know, early 1900s to 1920s was when most of the major um, quantum mechanics research was done. Um, but in general, so he, they were trying to look at these materials and say, okay, well, if we have this phosphorescent material, um, what other properties does it have? And so they had these minerals that glowed. In fact, these minerals didn't just glow if you expose them to light, they would actually continue to glow indefinitely when you put them in the dark. Um, and so that was really odd. And they noticed that they also gave off X-rays and X-rays was just a higher energy type of light. They could figure out what the wavelength of light was at this point, they were just, Missing quantum mechanics, they treated it like it was purely a wave at this point. They weren't treating light like it was a particle yet. Um, and so what Becquerel noticed is he actually just had a sample of this, this glowing mineral that he just left sitting on his desk on top of an x-ray plate. Um, and he just had it as a paperweight because it glowed. And, you know, nobody understood radiation poisoning or anything at that point. So... Why not use it as a, as a desk ornament, as a paperweight? Um, and so he just had it sitting on top of, of an x-ray and he noticed that it left black spots on the x-ray film. And so the, he was actually the first one to figure out something else was happening. Not only are, do these materials give off this kind of greenish glowing light, they're also putting out much higher energy radiation, much higher energy light in the x-ray spectrum. Um, which is what, this is literally a picture of the x-ray film that was sitting on his desk um, that led to the, the discovery of radioactivity. Um, so more of a historical note than anything you're actually supposed to take away from that picture. It's just that it's kind of cool. That's, we actually, we're getting far enough forward in science history. We actually have primary documents still. Um, So enter Marie Curie. Marie Curie um, was one of Becquerel's students, um, and she actually was Polish. Everybody is, thinks of Marie Curie as being French because that's where she did most of her research. And um, she married a, another grad student at the time um, whose name was Pierre. And so everybody assumes that Marie Curie was French. She was actually Polish. She had to leave Poland to go to France to be able to attend university. Because at, that, at this point in the late 1800s, it was still illegal for women to go to university in Poland. But France being a little bit more progressive, women were allowed to go to university. They still weren't allowed to go to grad school. Um, but, you know, baby steps. Marie Curie was able to convince Becquerel to take her on as a student, as a graduate student, and wound up marrying one of his other graduate students at the time, uh, Pierre. And she and Pierre were the ones who actually put in the work to figure out what are the actual elements that are glowing. And so the earliest use for these, is they actually used to paint them on the faces of watches so that you could tell what time it was in the dark. Um, they were really, really a big deal in World War I and World War II because aviators, wouldn't want to turn on lights in their cockpit because then they couldn't see outside and it would tell other people where they were. And so they would have these watches that had radium painted onto the, the face of the watch. Um, and if you've ever heard of the play Radium Girls, um, it's about the, the factory workers, the, the women who um, their job was literally to take radium and paint it on, radium paint and paint it onto these watch faces. Um, and to get really, really fine details 
um, they would lick their paintbrushes um, because that's how you got like a really nice fine um, paintbrush. And so most of them died of radiation poisoning. Um, and there's, so there's a really good book called Radium Girls that they've since turned into a play. I think it's probably a movie or maybe an Apple TV show, maybe or something. Was it a movie? And so there's something on streaming about, about that was based on radium girls, but it's true story. And most of them lost the lower half of their jaw. Um, they had to, they just sort of died. Um, the bone all died and the tissue died from radiation poisoning. Um, but so again, historical note. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about Marie Curie is that. So she is one of, there's now three people that have two Nobel Prizes. There were two people for a long time. Um, Marie Curie has, has, is one of, there's only two of them that have it in two different areas. Marie Curie has a Nobel Prize in physics for discovering and explaining how radioactivity worked. And also she has a Nobel Prize in chemistry for discovering elements. So radium was the one she discovered and, and she and Pierre would literally go through gravel that they had shipped in from Africa. There was a there was a particular region in Africa um, that they found had a higher than normal concentration of um, some of these elements in that in it. And so they would literally by hand go through and pick out chunks of gravel that had extra, more radium in it. Um, and so she discovered radium with Pierre and polonium, which is named after Poland because that's where she was born and raised. Um, and then later with um, with Irene, Irene also got a doctorate in in radioactive. I don't know if it was in physics or in chemistry, but Irene also won a Nobel Prize. Shared her Nobel Prize with her uh, mother in I think that was the one in chemistry um, where they discover curium. Um, and Eve did not go into the sciences, but just as badass, she actually was a journalist. And during World War II, when the rest of the Curies were evacuated from France before the Nazis took Paris, um, she, Eve stayed behind to be one of the leaders of the French re uh, resistance and wound up marrying, um, after the war, one of the first, I don't think he was the secretary general, but one of the first high level officials of the UN. Um, who won a Nobel Peace Prize. So poor Eve fought with the resistance, the only one in her immediate family that didn't win a Nobel Prize, uh, including her husband. But she did get to fight in the French resistance, which is pretty cool. And it's probably not cool at the time. It's cool in retrospect. So, um, Marie Curie was 102 when she died. She did not, Eve was 102. Um, Marie Curie died she lived a really long time. Everybody would assume that Pierre died, who died young, died from radiation poisoning. Um, he was actually just run over by a cart in, in the street. Just didn't uh, look both ways. Um, so he died really young. It had nothing to do with radiation. She was only 66. I thought she looked longer. She was only 66. Um, so she was only six, so she still died relatively young. Did she have radiation poisoning? I mean, almost certainly. Yeah. I don't know if that's what eventually what was the cause of death at that point. Um, radiation can cause a lot of long-term effects that aren't technically radiation poisoning. Radiation poisoning basically means that you start killing your uh, bone marrow cells and lots of your tissue just starts dying and your immune system dies. Um, yeah, it was radiation. It was ra radiation. Um, but it also, the other long-term effects are mostly cancer and tumors and things like that. So it can, whether or not it's radiation poisoning, it can be a result of the radiation exposure. So those are technically two different causes of death. Um, That's how I meant it, just like, yeah. That it in, in general, yes, almost certainly. It doesn't depend on like amount of exposure, like dosage as in well type. as proximity. So it turns out figuring out, um, how dangerous various radiations are. We're going to talk about different types of radiation today. Um, that actually plays a big role as well. Not just how intense it was or how long it was. Also, was it alpha particles or beta particles or gamma particles? Um, all of that factors into just how dangerous it is. And there is a combined, you go into medicine, there's actually a combined radiation exposure. There's a whole bunch, there's a ton of units in radiation. 
some of which take into how much of it is, is it absorbed and kind of factors in what type it is. That's what's that's a rad, um, like you know, from plague fallout. Um, rad exposure is basically it's radiation absorbed dosage. Um, and then, but there's also REMs and there's also Becquerels and there's also Curies are all different units of radiation that all have different effects. They're, they're at like different levels um, when you're considering. It's like the difference between, a, between amps versus voltage versus power versus kilowatt hours. They're all related to each other, uh, but they're all measuring slightly different things. And biology is really, really complicated and confusing. So we're gonna stay away from most of the biology applications when it comes to radiation, just because it's a whole nother bag of units um, that we don't necessarily get into. So uh, Marie specifically was the one who tied radiation and gamma rays and X-rays to specific elements um, and actually served as a, as a uh, X-ray tech before X-ray techs were a field you could specialize in during World War I. So in the midst of her research, World War I was happening. And so she was the one who, not only did she figure out that what x-rays, what they came from so that they could develop x-ray machines, um, she also worked in the field hospitals and x-ray soldiers figuring out where broken bones were, what, where um, metal, you know, shrapnel and lead and things like that were in people's bodies. Um, so she also got her her more than her fair share of um, time in the war zone um, voluntarily. Um, so radium and polonium. Radium is the one that was easiest to find because it glows green, right? So if you just if you're searching through gravel in the dark, you're just looking for pieces of gravel that are glowing green in the dark, um, and you pull all those out and then you refine it, trying to figure out what the heck it is and why it's glowing. Um, and really, we can also, we also want to specifically separate radiation from radioactivity, because those are two different things. Radiation is just light. Any light is radiation, technically. Electromagnetic radiation is the, is the physics term for any light. Um, Radioactivity specifically means radiation that's generated as a result of a nuclear reaction. So specifically a nuclear process breaking apart or forming new nuclei produces light, high energy light oftentimes, like gamma rays or x-rays. So the radiation is a side effect of the radioactivity. Um, and it, it's really, you know, it's one of those fields where a lot of words have made it into pop culture and have been misrepresented in pop culture when you talk about nuclear power plants, um, or even uh, NMR is a tool we use in organic chemistry, um, which is actually the true name of an MRI machine. Um, is MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. The actual name for that phenomena that it's measuring is nuclear magnetic resonance. But because the word nuclear got so villainized in the 50s and 60s, when they developed MRI machines, they couldn't call it nuclear magnetic imaging because nobody would ever go near it. Even though x-rays are have more radiation in them than an MRI machine, um, just the term nuclear and radiation in general gets so has so much baggage culturally um, that it's still to this day, the reason why we don't build nuclear power plants is because of in the 50s and 60s, the way that that term was, was demonized. Um, and we'll talk about nuclear power plants in a little bit more uh, detail later on. So what is radioact radioactivity specifically is when you have tiny high energy particles it says or gamma rays, but often it's and gamma rays, because gamma rays are just a specific, just like x-rays are a specific wavelength of light, um, are being emitted from an atom. And all, usually those high energy particles, they're moving really, really fast. And so they're ejected entirely from the nucleus. Basically, you get stuff flying out of these big nuclei. Are smoke detectors gamma rays? Not gamma rays. Uh, I believe that those are actually 
the earliest, the old school way of doing it was they were actually alpha particle emitters. Um, and then basically smoke detectors, I think now they're all just lasers, all just light based. Um, but what used to be the earliest smoke detectors were basically a radiation source and a radiation detector. And as long as the radiation from the source is hitting the detector, then it doesn't trip the alarm. But as soon as you get too many particles of smoke, smoke is just a whole bunch of tiny little solids, right? Floating around. You get a bunch of those in there, those alpha particles would hit the smoke and be reflected or absorbed by the smoke and not hit the detector. Um, and that's why actually if you have a if you um, have a smoke detector near a bathroom, if you if it gets really steamy, steam will actually set off the smoke detector because the light the, um, will get scattered by water particles just as well as smoke particles. So if you've ever noticed that before, um, that's that's what's happening with that. It's in basic, we'll talk about how well, I guess we've already talked about light back with, with uh, or quantum to some extent. So literally it's just radioactivity is just pieces of the nucleus flying off. Um, thing is they tend to fly off with a huge amount of energy. And when they do that, it's like tiny little atom sized bullets flying out. And so that's why radiation radioactivity causes damage to tissue is it's literally these tiny little chunks that'll fly through your cells. And if they happen to knock apart something that's important to that cell on their way through, then you wind up with that cell dying potentially. Um, or if it, hits a, if it hits your DNA, you can wind up with mutations happening as a result of this. Because literally it's just knocking stuff apart when it comes through. Um, and so we're gonna define a few other terms and then we'll take our break. Um, so, this is nuclear, when I keep saying nuclear reactions, what the definition of a nuclear reaction just means that the reaction is changing a nucleus. So you don't have all the same atoms afterwards that you did before. So it really is sort of a separate class of reactions compared to most of what we've been dealing with. You have to balance chemical or nuclear reactions differently than standard chemical reactions, right? Because if the nucleus is changing, then you might not have the same number of carbons on your product side as your reactive side. And that's back six months ago when you first learned how to balance reactions or more than that um, in, some, in many cases. One of the fundamental pieces of how do you balance a reaction is you just make sure you have the same number of every atom on both sides, right? That doesn't work with nuclear reactions because nuclear reactions are one of two things. Either you have fission or fusion happening. Fission um, is one is naturally, it, oh, both of these are naturally occurring. Um, fission is what we think about when we think about radio, radioactivity happening on Earth. Usually what we're thinking about is fission. It's basically when you get nuclei big enough, they're not stable. Their nuclei are held together by two different forces, um, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. And strong nuclear force is usually the strongest of the two, hence the name. Um, and a strong nuclear force is basically what keeps all the protons in a nucleus together. Normally you would think, well, nuclei are all positive or have a bunch of positive protons, right? Why would a bunch of protons stick together to make a nucleus in the first place? Because positives repel other positives. Shouldn't they be constantly flying apart? The strong nuclear force, if you get to a small enough distance scale, strong nuclear force actually will keep these particles together, even though the electromagnetic force charges are trying to throw them apart from each other. However, there's also the weak nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force is basically how neutrons and protons interact with each other. And if you don't have the right ratio of neutrons and protons, that's not a stable nucleus. It might stick together for a little bit, but eventually it breaks down and pieces fly off. And that's what fission is. When you get above, I think it's lead 208 or lead 206, every nucleus that's larger than that is inherently unstable and will, given enough time, will split up into smaller pieces, will go through fission reactions. Sometimes it's a big fission reaction, like 
um, you can have a uranium atom split up into um, all the way all the way into like calcium and whatever the other however many protons left that is. It's like um, lead and calcium. And you just have it break apart into two chunks and you get two smaller nuclei as a result. And but sometimes you just get like little tiny bits of the nucleus flying off randomly. And those are the, the processes we're gonna talk about in more detail. Um, the other side of this is if you start from small nuclei, like say individual protons, if you force them together close enough, then the strong nuclear force takes over. And you turn something like two hydrogen atoms into one helium atom. You still need the right number of nuclei to make it stable. Or sorry, nuclei, the right number of neutrons to make it stable. But fusion is basically just when you force these things together, even though electromagnetic force is pushing them apart, you force them together close enough, they stick. And that's a fusion reaction. So fusion literally just means you fuse two things together. Fission means splitting things apart. Like creating a fissure, if you've ever heard that term, a geology term or just in English, a fissure just means a gap between things, right? Uh, fission is creating a gap between two pieces of a nucleus to make it two new nuclei. All right, let's, we'll stop there for now. When we come back and we'll talk about all the different types of fission. Um, and how we can calculate these energies. Come back at five after. Yeah. Okay. So the whole mass or the Yeah, I'm taking the in your change. So you're changing from this is the one that's going to <laughs> So you're just busy. What's up? Could you get this? That's how many moles one has two others you have. So that's the way you figure out the problem set to be used. Okay, so that's how you get this number. But to get this number, it's just that you're changing those in biosulfate. You're starting to concentrate the of course, the reaction. This is why the color show. When you run out with the thiamine sulfate, yeah. then iodine starts building up and it turns blue. Yeah. So your change in thiamine sulfate for every reaction is always going to be this amount goes to zero. So that's so that's so that's that that. negative. So it's going to be a negative. Negative this for the time. What did the time it took? Yeah. Oh, the time. So for each of these, the time is on the change. Yeah, that's what it's going to be for each product. And the rate is going to be changed? That's not what it's going to be. It's probably going to be right there. Oh, okay. Because the rate of the reaction is always defined as being positive. So if you're if you're looking at it, how much difference is being used up, that goes next to the thing. It's like you get a negative and a negative cancel. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. That's because you said it like for five days. Yeah. Technically, for both of them. In a way. There we go. I'm going to watch. Devin, do you want to push? If you're supposed to use 238 or 135, I also have this one. Two thirty-five. Yeah. So the new thirty-eight is not weapon. Yeah. So yeah, two thirty-five, and then for the startup switch, we use. I think it's the Barrett's line. Yeah. The Barrett's line creates the helium, and then the rhodium uses that. Rhodium is like it's like a mediator almost. Yeah, it's like mediator. Yeah, that's what creates that that neutron to actually start up the process. Right. Yeah. And then for the 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 helium helium is like the route the reactor is starting to start up. Right. So it's like way easier to keep them going at a constant rate than yeah. it is to, to turn them off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Good I forgot.
Well, well, that's always nice when you figure out that it's not only is it right, but why it's right. Yeah, because like, I, yeah, it's that. Oh, yeah, she did it her way, then I did it a different way, so in the same way, what leads to the numbers. That same answer. I didn't know how or why. I able to go over like, the procedure with me so I know what things to take out because yeah one I forgot which ones you said we're not doing and then it's just complicated this thing. Yeah. So what were the, the ones up the um, methods we're not going to be using again? So you're not going to be using HPLC. So it's mainly the, the purification and the analysis. So this is all good. Uh, that's chlorogenic acid, right? So that should already be in there. Um, the vacuum filter. So we're trying to separate. Maybe it's just mm -hmm. silica, but we could uh -huh. we can order some specifically to do to use that. Um, to do that purification process. This is the, that's the step we're not using TLC, or we can we can do TLC. We can't do HPLC, and we can't do it. Yeah, it doesn't say what chemicals. That's using acetate. Yeah, so toluene ethyl acetate mixture as the salt. So you're doing that's called column chromatography, which is basically you're just going to to put um, all that silide through um, in a tube. And you're going to pass solvent through it that has your chlorogenic acid. And the chlorogenic acid and all the other stuff that's in there will pass through it at different rates. And so then when it comes out the bottom, it's basically, it's a, it's a lot like a beer. And, um, what comes out the bottom of that tube is going to be you know, after a certain amount of time, you'll get your first compound. But a lot of times, you'll be able to see it visually. They're different colors. Um, so I think we can do the um, the that purification. The TLC. We we'll get we have some that are similar to that. We might have to adapt that a little bit, but I can put you on that. Um, I usually they wouldn't call it a hair dryer, they would call it a heat gun. <laughs> but um they're trying to sound yeah. sound scientific about it. Yeah. Um, but we have a we have a heat gun, so we can do that to do the drying part of the thing. Butanol water, acetic acid, we've got that, and water is reached, solvent is reached. Yeah, that all looks good. And then we're just gonna not do the NMR and the HPLC. Okay. So that some of the chemicals that I wrote down would be for those. Yes, yeah, so we don't need HPLC grade methanol because we're not doing HPLC. Um, and we don't need the TMS. Um, yeah, there's the silicon dioxide. I think we can we can order the, the silicon. 
And we have methylene chloride, yeah, you leave that. We have that activated that part. So uh, the rest of that though. Is there anything on here that I can start ordering? Um specifically the psyllite. Um yeah, it's going to be and then maybe the glassy syrup powder if that's different than the psyllite. Um, and we have some TLC plates. They might not be the same TLC plates, but we have some little work. Um, and then if there's any, was there any mechanical stuff? That, other than that, I think the rest of that is good. And because we're going we're gonna to end up getting the coffee, the green coffee um, locally, right? I'm going I'm to try their roots. Okay. I'm Either, not sure if they'll have every bite of that. I mean, we could probably, if you can find it on Amazon, we can get it um, just through Amazon too, and Amazon's quick shipping. Um, so if you can't find it, you better it's one of those others. We have activated carbon. We have activated, we have, oh, we have so much activated carbon. Yes, do that. And I, so the, we do have that, yeah. So that's going to be for drying stuff. You don't need the five CQA, I don't think, because that's we're going to extract. It's going to extract. Um, so I think the rest of that looks good. Um, just double check the mechanical stuff. See if there's anything. Specific that it's, that you haven't seen around, um, but I, I'd be happy to go through that again to go through that part of the day too after after class. That, 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 all right. Let's let's talk about types of fission real quick. So fusion fusion is kind of its own class of molecules, and this is going to be far from an exhaustive list of types of fission because the specifics to any of these reactions there's there's lots. You know, we kind of have a couple of classifications of types of these reactions, but a, a lot of them are just sort of like generic. Big thing splits into two small things. Specific depend on entirely on what is it that you're starting with, isotope, and what element are you talking about to begin with, um, and what are the exact conditions of it. Um, when you and fusion kind of works the same way, depending on on what elements you have present and what pressure they're under. You know, the way fusion occurs naturally in in the universe is predominantly in stars. Um, stars are just big clouds of gas that are so big that the gravity at the center is strong enough to force these nuclei that are pushing each other away. It pushes them together anyway because there's so much gravity. And so if there's that much gravity, that you can cause a fusion reaction with just about anything. It just might not stay fused. If you make something that's not stable, it'll break down into other things, which is why a lot of um, a lot of the synthetic elements have really short half-lives because we haven't found an isotope that's actually safe. We can cause, that is a fusion reaction. We make those synthetic isotopes through fusion. We use particle accelerators basically to just take small charged particles, small nuclei, and slam them together hard enough that they fuse. If you do it with the right speed, with the right energy, and you use the right nuclei, sometimes you can get them to stick together long enough that you can consider it a new element. So we can do, fusion is kind of like limitless as far as what we can make, at least temporarily. It might then just split apart. Um, but we don't typically have like classifications of fusion reactions because they're going to be all, you know, highly dependent on what pressure, what's around, things like that. Um, and if you want an idea of like just the magnitude, how big does something have to get before you start seeing fusion? Jupiter is almost a brown dwarf. A brown dwarf is a star 
that didn't quite get big enough to start a true self-sustaining fusion reaction. It's pretty big. They're bigger than Jupiter by maybe a factor of 10. Um, and if you get any bigger than that, you get true, what they call stellar fusion, where you get a real star formation happening. So Jupiter is almost a star. Um, a brown dwarf is even closer to being a star. And you get much bigger than that, say like 15 times bigger than Jupiter, that's enough to, especially if it's all hydrogen. Hydrogen fuses better than a lot of other elements. Um, which is kind of what creates the natural life cycle of a star. They call it the life cycle, even though it's not alive. The life cycle of a star is basically if you start with all hydrogen and it goes through a whole bunch of fusion reactions, then you make helium. And then helium fuses together with more hydrogen or with other heliums, and you make larger elements and larger elements. And eventually you get to the point where you have hardly any he um, helium or hydrogen left. And that means that your the energy that half that is you're gaining from these fusion reactions starts to slow down. And eventually it gets to the point where those, um, where the star gets hot enough and there's not enough fusion still happening to keep the star all together. And that's what can cause a supernova. It's basically you get to the point where you have too many big nuclei too close together in that electromagnetic repulsion will throw things apart once you reach a certain sort of cutoff threshold. Um, and, but if, it, if it's not something that's big enough that you actually get a supernova, there's other things that can happen instead. So it's, but that's that sort of natural process of you start with lots of small pieces and get more and more big, and those pieces get bigger and bigger over time, is what leads to stars gradually cooling down as they get over and over. But we're talking on, you know, billions of years, uh, over the course of billions of years. We're not talking about anything soon. Sydney, a while ago, you had your hand up. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, I'm just gaining questions now for the quizzes, so. <laughs> That's so, perfect. That's fine. I'm like, Keep <laughs> um, all right, so when we're talking about fission, there are some classifications that we use that are, that are really common processes that happen. And so this is a list of the most common types um, of fission reactions that we see happening sort of in nature. Um, and those are going to be mostly alpha particles, beta particles, positrons, and electron capture have the same net effect on a reaction. We'll figure out, we'll learn how to write these products out if we know it's going through one of these processes. Um, and then gamma rays a lot of times get represented as being a separate process, but that's not really strictly speaking true. Gamma rays are going to accompany most of these other processes. Most of these, these other processes are all going to have an inherent amount of energy release that's happening. And just like we saw when we first learned about, about um, orbitals, when electrons change energy levels, they can create a photon. And the energy of that photon is based on how much energy is being given off when those electrons move orbitals, right? Well, nuclei don't have orbitals per se, but we can still have huge amounts of energy changing hands. These are hugely exothermic reactions. And if it's so exothermic that you don't have time for the energy to be passed out through these vibrating molecules, then if we don't, it doesn't get given off as heat, it gets given off by generating a photon. And so these gamma rays and X-rays and other type of radiation that you get from radioactive processes are mostly a byproduct of these other things happening. They're not a nuclear reaction on their own. But for whatever reason, in some textbooks, uh, especially at the Gen Chem level, they, it gets written as though it's its own process. But it really, all of these are going to have some amount of gamma rays or other high energy photons coming off as, as a result as well. I guess part of the reason that gamma rays get their own category is because they're a different type of radiation that comes off. They're, they damage your cells in a different way than alpha particles or beta particles. So from, a, from an anatomy point of view, from a biology point of view, gamma rays are different than the others. From a physics point of view, they're a byproduct of all the rest of these. Gamma rays is target deeper. Gamma, so... It's like... This one, so they actually refer to different types of radiation, radioactivity, have different penetrating ability. 
I think this is one that has a built in. I've sold this slide from somewhere else that has. Oh, it doesn't. I must have gotten rid of the sound effects. It used to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so anyway, an alpha particle, because it, we'll talk about what it is in a second, but it's bigger than beta particles or, or photons. So alpha particles get blocked really quickly by high density material. It doesn't take very much material to block them. In fact, even like an alpha particle would have a hard time just making it through like a flame shirt. Like zinc, like things like barriers. Yeah, things that you don't need a whole lot. Yeah, they're not that dense. In general, the more dense something is, the better it shields you from radioactivity um, because basically those other nuclei either deflect it or slow it down. They, you know, soak up some of that energy just like if you were trying if you pictured um i don't know a a bullet going through a sandbag and then hitting someone versus the bullet just hitting someone their bullets going to be going very very different speed if it has to go through a sandbag first right so those radioactive particles are really um, the products of radioactive processes i don't want to call them radiation um are going to be Based on how big they are, different materials will block them faster. Um, beta particles will go straight through something. So, it, like I said, just 0 0.01 millimeters. So, foil, lead foil is enough to stop alpha particles. A one millimeter thick piece of lead. So, now we're talking about something that's a little bit more like a, a really thin sheet of lead is enough to block beta particles. <laughs> um, gamma rays light can wind up going straight through this high energy photons um and they're so high energy they can wind up going through even chunks of lead that are that are 10 centimeters thick because there's just really nothing that absorbs that level that um wavelength of light because it's so high energy um so that's what we don't use gamma rays to take to take x-rays to do any imaging because they're actually just too high energy. X-rays are produced by a lot of the same processes and they're slightly safer to work with because they're not as high energy. So they can be absorbed and slowed down more by other materials. Um, although it's still not enough, you're still not really slowing down x-rays very much with that little lead jacket that they have you put on at the dentist's office. That's still not really doing much of anything for x-rays. Oh, really? Um, so you're still getting a security blanket. Yeah. You're still getting like penetration. Yeah. I think they <laughs> well, and part of that is just how often they're being exposed, right? If you're taking six six x-rays a day every working day for your entire career, that's a much higher dose of radiation than if than normal. But just getting one x-ray every six months when you go to the dentist's office, you get more more radiation exposure. Than that just by going for a bike ride or going to the beach um, up here at altitude. Um, so part of it is just is just a safe like x-rays, getting your x-ray taken these days, especially we have better ways of generating x-rays, um, is really, really pretty safe. You don't even really need that, but it is just you know allows them to legally um, say that uh, that they limited your radiation exposure. Um, but it's not really all that effective. They say, is it, I don't know, I, I feel like I've heard this. Do you get radiation from flying? You do. And so is it just because you're higher up and it's like easier penetrated? Like, and, you know, and you're less protected by the Earth's magnetic field. The closer you are, the thicker the atmosphere is, the um, you, more you're both protected by the other air particles, but also um, just the Earth's magnetic field is part of what allows life to happen on Earth, and the reason that all of our atmosphere hasn't been blown away into space like Mars. Mars had an atmosphere almost as thick as Earth's at one point, but their, their geologic activity there is like there's a person on Mars. Um, Mars's geologic activity ceased, and so their mag the magnetic field around Mars ceased. And so the solar radiation just plain up blasted all of Mars's um, atmosphere off into the rest of the solar system. So the Earth's magnetic field is really, really crucial for diverting a lot of that, that energy around the Earth, um, which is why astronauts, even just on the International Space Station, which is not that high up, I think it's what, 100 miles off the, off the surface of the Earth, 
um, is still like they have a huge amount of radiation that those astronauts wind up absorbing. And that's actually one of the biggest issues with doing something like a manned mission to Mars is just all of those months of being exposed to the sun's radiation with absolutely zero uh, magnetic field to protect you. Um, but that's a separate issue. Um, getting back here, as far as the sun's radiation, the sun's high energy radiation is sort of its, its, its own thing. It's kind of a combination of several of these. We'll talk about it in a, in a little bit. Um, but alpha particles are one of the first types of particles that, that were known to be to show up from radiation. They didn't really know what they were at first. Um, but they're actually, that's actually part of everybody remember the Rutherford, Rutherford gold foil experiment. It wasn't actually bouncing x-rays through that gold foil. It was actually using alpha particles. And then, again, they didn't know why alpha particles existed or what they were at this point, but they knew that. Um, this material produced these tiny high energy particles and they were using them to test properties of that gold foil. Um, and so literally all an alpha particle is, is a helium nucleus. A helium-4 nucleus basically gets ejected out of a, nu of a larger nucleus. So uranium-238, when it, um, if it goes through alpha particle decay, you basically just have a helium particle flying off on its own. And we say specifically it's a helium nucleus because really it doesn't have any of its own electrons. It might grab an electron as it's on its way through um, the uranium uh, electron clouds. But for the most part, it's moving so fast that it's going to have a plus two charge. It's a helium with a plus two charge. Um, so it's a relatively large chunk. Uh, and it's just two protons, two neutrons, which is one of the most stable nuclei that there that there is. And so it's just kind of uh, the uranium is just sort of shedding pieces of itself, um, and in the shape of a helium atom. Now, um, the other thing that we're going to do a lot with these nuclear reactions in general, when we're talking about nuclear reactions, we're going to ignore electrons. We're not going to worry about charge on things, because when we're talking about nuclear reactions, we're not talking about ions forming or ionic bonds or anything like that. And so a lot of times, even though even though that helium nucleus would have a plus two charge and it would leave behind the thorium with a minus two charge, we just don't track that in general. because We're more interested in what nuclei there are um, before and after. That is one of the other aspects of radiation that winds up being damaging is a helium with a plus two charge is really, really unstable. It's going to grab electrons. As soon as it slows down, it's going to grab electrons from whatever it's, whatever it bumps into um, to make itself more stable. Um, but really, it's mostly just the fact that it's moving really, really fast that can cause tissue damage. Um, and so writing out the results of a alpha particle decay. If you're, if I tell you, hey, this element breaks down via alpha particle decay, um, you just say, okay, well, count how many, the way we balance these now is you want to, you want to have the same number of nucleons is the term, which is protons plus neutrons. So uranium 238 has 238 combined protons and neutrons, right? At the other end, when it's done, four of those nucleons have turned into a helium atom. And the fact that it, it lost two protons because we made helium is what turned it from uranium to thorium. If you look on the periodic table, two spots to the left of uranium is thorium. Thorium-234 can also go undergo alpha decay. So thorium-234 goes through alpha decay. Let me just pull up a periodic table. So we're down here. Uranium loses an alpha particle. Uranium-238 loses an alpha particle, becomes thorium-234. 
thorium-234, thorium is number 90, right? Atomic number 90. So if it loses two protons to form a um, alpha particle, what element is left over? Radium. Radium. You shift over two more. 88 is radium. And if it's which isotope of radium, if it was thorium-234, subtract four from that 234 because the mass of the helium is four as two neutrons and two protons. So it shifts from thorium to radium. And if it was thorium-234, it becomes radium-230. So if I was writing this out, thorium-234, turns into 230 and it's radium, which is Ra plus. The other way of writing an alpha particle you sometimes see is just you write the letter alpha with the four to say it's an alpha particle, but it is a helium atom as well. So they mean the same thing. The other thing that can wind up being helpful is um, I don't know about how Carl teaches it, but usually when I teach this notation where we keep track of the isotope to the top left, there's also a version where you write the number of protons to the bottom left, but that's kind of redundant if you have a periodic table in front of you, right? Because if it's uranium, you already know it's got 92 protons, but it can be helpful in this case for showing what's happening, right? The way we balance these reactions is 92 on one side, 92 protons. And on the other side, there's 90 and two. So it still adds up to 92 protons. And 238 and 234 and four, it still adds up to 238 nucleons total. So this is how we balance reactions when we're talking about nuclear reactions. We're not worried about charges. We're not worried about the same elements or nuclei. We're worried about, do we have the same number of nucleons on both sides. And to a lesser extent, the same number of protons, although the number of protons can change, which we'll see in a second. How do, I'm sorry, but how do we know like what is breaking up into? I'll tell you. Okay, I'm just so like- if I say this isotope goes through alpha decay. Okay. So you just have to know that alpha decay means this. Right, so it just means it shoots off an alpha particle. As long as you know that an alpha particle is helium atom, you should be able to finish the rest of that, right? It's always going to be one. It, it can happen sequentially, and which is one of the reasons, has anybody heard the term of a breeder reactor or a second generation nuclear reactor? So one of the reasons that people, that nuclear reactors, nuclear power plants got um, villainized is because if you start from uranium, usually in power plants, it's uranium-235. 238 is the weapons grade uranium. But either way, they both go through an alpha decay usually. But thorium goes through an alpha decay at a different rate. It has a different rate constant for the second reaction is the first reaction. So you actually have to get rid of the, the nuclear power plant or the um, uh, fuel rods. Our fuel rods in a nuclear power plant are just... Um, a big cylinder of, or, or you know, square um, that's high in uranium-235 if it's if we're using it for a power plant. Um, what do you do when most, when the 235 is not, uranium-235 isn't there enough and you have more thorium around? You know, on the time scale we're dealing with, it's never going to be like the most of it's converted. The half-life for this process is really, really long. But it can drop enough that you actually have it, you're not giving off as much power as you were, not giving off as much energy. But if you change the engineering, you can actually take an, a, the same general idea of a nuclear power plant and design it to work with thorium instead of with uranium. So a second generation uh, reactor or a breeder reactor basically is designed to use the waste from a first generation reactor and turn it into its own reactor. And it keeps going. And then in theory, you could keep going and have third generation, fourth generation, et cetera. You need to change the engineering 
what are the ratios of isotopes you need? How much power can you make? How big can the control rods be? How big can the um, can the fuel rods be? But at this, there's nothing preventing us from designing a power plant that uses thorium, and that's a second generation nuclear reactor or a breeder reactor is just taking the byproducts from the first one, the waste from the first power plant, and making a new power plant. Um, but all that came from somebody asking, um, and then how do we know it's going to happen again? I'll tell you, right? Because, and even I don't necessarily know every single isotope has some decay pattern. Like uranium-238 turns to thorium-234, thorium-234 turns to radium-230, and then might go through a beta particle decay instead of an alpha particle decay, and that ships in a different direction. And then that product goes through an alpha particle decay again. And it all eventually ends up at something about the same size as lead, because that's when you get to the point where the nuclei are actually stable again, when you get down to the size of a of a lead nucleus, lead 206 or 208. 208. Well, like granite works, right? That's why there's radon in granite, because radon is one of the end results, is towards the end of this process. If you keep going, when we go back to the periodic table, if radium goes through an alpha particle decay, okay. radium is 88. It goes through another alpha particle decay, you get 86. 86 is radon, when that changes the chemical pro um, properties enough that it doesn't stay radium, thorium, uranium, they're all metals, right? So they all still behave like metals. They can also be found in relatively stable minerals. But radon is a gas. So as a result of this process, you wind up making a gas. And that gas can either be trapped inside the minerals or if that, if that material is made of, is somewhat porous, like granite, or like any, anything where you've got um, lots of uh, tectonic activity breaking these minerals up, that radon winds up getting released. And since it's a gas, it winds up rising to the surface. So it's not just gas in general, or granite in general necessarily, it's granite that's high in uranium ore as one of the components of the granite can wind up giving off radon over time. And that's just because one of the minerals when the volcanic... Right, when that, when that chunk of granite was formed, granite's just made up a bunch of smaller chunks of minerals, right? If one of those minerals has a significant amount of uranium in it, um, then you can wind up with that process happening. Typically, the older the granite is, the less of an issue it is for something like making a countertop out of it, because Given enough time, if it's a chunk of granite that's several billion years old, most of the uranium, the half-life of uranium-235 is something like something like two and a half billion years. So something that's really, really long, but the older your chunk of granite is, the less uranium it has in it currently. Do you think that's why they went to metamorphic? Like, I know there's like other- like a lot of reasons to go for it. Granite's actually not as nice as it looks in some people's taste, it, there's a lot of mechanical engineering reasons why it's not great as a countertop. It breaks really easily. It doesn't handle temperature change well. Um, but that's all. I don't, I don't think that, if, if anything, if it had anything to do with the, the radon coming out of it, it was probably because there were headlines about it. And so everybody decided to move away from it just because, because it got you know sort of Wonderful. canceled. Granite, granite countertops got canceled for having radon in them or something, you know, and whether or not that's actually a valid reason to be worried um, is another story. It depends on the granite. Granite is just kind of a unit umbrella term for a lot of different materials, right? Depending on what those materials are. Um, will change whether or not it handles heat well. And handling heat well is, is kind of a subjective term as well. Um, there's handling heat well, and then there's handling heat really well. Like you could just put a screaming hot pan right on, put it right on a granite countertop. It might not handle that well, but it can handle like normal, like pot of boiling water just fine. Anyway, away from, from counter material no, debates. No, it's okay. <laughs> That's a good question about the radon. Um, 
And there's actually some really interesting maps. If you look at radon detection in basements and in houses, there's some cool GIS maps um, that look at, and you can actually trigger, you can track geological areas of the United States by where radon is an issue. All right, so I mentioned before that not every nucleus will go through alpha particle decay. It's one of the most common ones, especially for the really heavy elements. Um, but you can also have a beta particle decay. Beta particle decay is a little bit weird because a beta particle decay, a beta particle is an electron. The thing is, it's coming from the nucleus, not from the electron clouds, which is weird because you were taught that there's no electrons in a nucleus, right? It turns out that's not exactly true. It turns out if you take an electron and you force it onto a proton, like going through a fusion reaction, you can actually turn a proton into a neutron now. Which also means the reverse can happen. And then a beta particle decay is basically one of those neutrons gives off an electron and turns back into being a proton. And so the net result of that is that the mass of the nucleus, the mass of the nucleus isn't changing because this, you have the same number of nucleons. All that happened is an electron flow. An electron has next to no mass, right? And if an electron has next to no mass, it's still got 14 nucleons in there. It's just that one of the neutrons turned into a proton. So we're balancing these. The other way that you see a beta particle written is sometimes with a minus one where you would write the number of protons. So that seven plus minus one adds up to six for the sake of balancing. Um, I don't particularly like that because you, how do you have a negative proton? You don't have a negative proton, you have an electron. Um, so I generally write it like this, but you can even just write plus electron and you're not wrong. The fact that it's written as a beta particle instead of a, uh, just writing um, like this is because this is indicating specifically that it came from the nucleus, not that it came from some other random chemical reaction, like a redox reaction. It's not a redox reaction. It's a nuclear reaction where you're actually converting a neutron into a proton. Um, if you want to get into the theoretical physics, I don't know very much about theoretical physics or this, the, what's called the standard model, but basically um, protons and neutrons are each made up of uh, three quarks. And, and I, don't mix, I always mix up which one is which. One of them is two up quarks and one down quark. The other one is two down quarks and one up quark. And when you take a down quark and you turn it into an up quark, it generates an electron out of nothing. And you actually turn it from being a, from a neutron to a proton. So it's not like, it's not really that it, electrons are stuck to a, a, pot, a proton and that's what makes it a neutron. It's really that there's this other weirder process of quarks changing from an up quark to a down quark, which is a little bit like an electron flipping spin. Um, but the process of doing that, the same way that an electron going from high energy to low energy can create a photon out of nothing, a quark flipping from up to down creates an electron out of nothing, which is weird. But theoretical physics is weird. The, another fallout reference. There's the, the lines. They asked me. They asked me if I had a degree in theoretical physics, and I said I had a theoretical degree in physics. <laughs> That's about where I am with theoretical physics. Or like, um, have they been able to, to then with our technology? Have they been able to visualize these particles? The quarks. Um, the alpha and beta particles. Alpha particles and beta particles. Yes. Um, I don't know about quarks, but that's one of the other uses for particle accelerators is smashing protons together hard enough that they fly apart into their individual quarks. Um, if you're more interested in that, the Wikipedia page on what you want to look for is 
what's called the standard model of physics. The standard model of physics is basically like an even smaller periodic table. It's, I think it's, it's like eight columns by four rows that has all of the known types of particles that exist. There's like six, they call them flavors of quarks. This is what happened when you have physicists in the 60s doing research on really weird abstract stuff is they name it really weird abstract things. Oh, yeah. So yeah, basically. Um, they said they were sitting around tripping, thinking about their research and came up with what we call it flavors of quarks. Um, the flavors, the six flavors of quarks are like up, down, left, right, charm, and strange. You and me both. Um, and it, or it might have, it might have been one of those. There were no drugs involved, and the people that figured this out just had to be thinking on on a totally different plane of existence than the ways already. But acid makes more sense. <laughs> um, all right. So if we have something going through beta decay, just like with with alpha decay, I'll have to tell you it's beta decay, right? So beta decay. If I say a carbon fourteen goes through beta decay, that just means it's going to turn, it's going to give off an electron from the nucleus. You're still going to have something with a mass of 14. It's just that one of those 14 nucleons, one of the eight, you had eight neutrons here, one of those eight neutrons turned into a proton. Um, and the reason that that happens is that those strong and weak forces that are interacting are more stable with a with a one to one to one ratio of neutrons to protons than they are at a six to eight ratio, whatever that is, three to four ratio of protons and neutrons at this size of an atom. That changes as the as the nuclei get bigger. This gets weirder. Um, but effectively, as long as you can say, okay, well, I know what that beta decay means, it gives off an electron. So how do I balance things? Well, if it gave off an electron, the only way it really is balanced is if one of those neutrons turned into a proton. You just have to sort of walk it backwards, walk the logic backwards to figure out what your new product is going to be. The next product be oxygen then? If it continued to go, um, nitrogen 14 is really, really stable. So nitrogen 14, in, everything is radioactive to some extent, Everything that's not, I think it's iron, iron 56 maybe, um, is the most stable nucleus in the universe. Everything that's not iron 56 will eventually go through some version of these until it becomes iron 56. Um, but at the time scale we're used to dealing with, like the age of the solar system, uh, nitrogen 14 is stable enough that we just say it's not radioactive. And so it's stable and it just stays there. It doesn't have a half-life or a rate constant um, for, for um, nitrogen-14 decaying via anything. But if it did, it would turn it, then it'd turn it into oxygen. You're right. This one's even cooler. You can, there's also some, the opposite can happen. If, if a neutron turning into a proton creates an electron out of nothing, a proton turning into a neutron creates a positron out of nothing. And a positron is really weird because a positron is an electron with a positive charge, which is actually one of the first um, pieces of evidence that antimatter existed. Antimatter is literally regular matter with the charges flipped. So a positron is antimatter. A positron but a positron can be created if you do the reverse. Instead of flipping an up quark to a down quark, if you flip a down quark to an up quark, you get the opposite thing happening. You turn it a neutron or a proton into a neutron. And when you turn a proton into a neutron to balance the charges out, you have to create a positron. And you can think of it a little bit like the proton lost its charge. It's not exactly what's happening, but the net result of, of it is you can think of the positron as the positive charge of a proton leaving. And so what's left, if you take a proton and you remove its positiveness, positivity, you get a neutron. 
So if we create a positron, and we usually still just write it as a beta particle, just with a plus one charge instead. But the same thing is happening. The, the mass number is not changing. But you went from having 15 protons to only 14 protons. Where did that extra charge go? It turned into a positron. Again, not exactly what's happening, but you can think of it that way and get the right answers. And if you're going from my class into theoretical physics, you're gonna to have to unlearn pretty much everything from this chapter anyway. So, but but it's, the net results still work, but I'm not just the positrons. So the way antimatter works is if you have a positron, if you have anything that's antimatter and it turns and it encounters the same particle in regular matter, they actually go through a process called annihilation and they both disappear and they turn into pure energy. Pure energy. Light. Okay. Um, so basically it's, you get more gamma rays, other types of, of light from this. Well, basically where we're headed with this, where the, why this is really fun is this has some mass. It's a really small mass, right? But it has some mass. So does an electron. If a positron and an electron hitting each other, they both disappear and turn completely into energy. How do we know how much energy we get? How bright it is, we can measure the light. We can actually predict it ahead of time using one of the most famous equations. It helps if I remember all the variables. E equals mc squared. E equals mc squared is such an important equation because Einstein literally proved that mass is energy. So if you take mass and you turn it into pure light, we can predict how much light is given off in terms of joules per mole by looking at how much mass you had before and after. If you've ever noticed that on the periodic table, a lot of those radio, those, um, like the mass of a proton is 1.008, right? Mass of a, of a hydrogen nucleus. Um, but if you look at the mass of, um, say, something made up of a bunch of protons and neutrons, it's less than the sum of the pieces. If you look at the mass of, like, fluorine, mass of fluorine is like 18.998, but the mass of a proton is 1.008, the mass of a neutron is 1.007. So how the heck can you take 19 of them and get a number that's less than 19? That extra energy is called the nuclear binding energy. The energy that holds the nucleus together with that strong and weak nuclear force. We can figure out how much energy it takes to hold the nucleus together by taking the difference in mass and plugging it into E equals mc squared. Okay. So sometimes it's that the fluorine only has one isotope naturally, and it's still 18.99 something. It's less than 19. Okay. So some of that mass is converted to energy. Exactly. It's the energy that's holding it together. And if you break that apart into its pieces, it's all released at once. And so the, the reason I write is delta E equals delta M is because in um, chemistry, we deal with before and after, right? We don't care about the actual amount of binding energy. We care about how much energy is liberated as actually the term that gets used sometimes when you go through a chemical reaction. And from for that, we can actually just total up the final mass of everything and the initial minus the initial mass of everything to get a delta M. And if you plug delta M in, D equals MC squared, you get the change in energy for that reaction. So that's actually where we're headed with this in um, a few, there's a nuclear binding energy, um, a few different ones. We can actually total this up and we'll actually practice doing this. So you actually get to use E equals MC squared, which is fun. You can go see your parents next and they ask you how college has been going. You can say, it's good. I learned about E equals MC squared and they'll be dutifully impressed. At least they should be. I don't know my dad. The first question I've ever had is whether I've just quit my life. I don't know how to surf board. That is impressive. As someone who surfs, um, this is the first time you get on a swimming pool. 
Excuse All right, me. we're going to end there. We're going to so what will be on the quiz this week will be some of the great stuff, and then maybe some like the reaction or alpha particles and beta particles. <laughs> Um, that's all for and then it's like,